This is Lesson 15.5, Constitutional Rule in England and the Dutch Republic. What do England and the Dutch Republic have in common? They both have constitutions. So let's pretend that we were writing an LEQ with this prompt. Describe and explain significant causes and effects of the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Well, let's look at our College Board topics. First, we've got College Board Topic 3.2, the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Explain the causes and consequences, that's a historical thinking skill, of the English Civil War. The English Civil War, a conflict among the monarchy, par parliament, and other elites over their respective roles in the political structure, exemplified the competition for power among monarchs and competing groups. And the outcome of the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution protected the rights of gentry and aristocracy from absolutism through assertions of the rights of Parliament. And then we've got College Board Topic 3.5, Absolutism and Constitutionalism explain the factors that contributed to the development of the Dutch Republic. The Dutch Republic, established by a Protestant revolt against the Habsburg monarchy, developed an oligarchy of urban gentry and rural landholders to promote trade and protect traditional rights. Now, if this stuff doesn't mean much to you yet, it will after the, this presentation. LEQ points. Let's just have a quick review, and here's a disclaimer. For the purpose of learning content along with how you write an LEQ, I'm throwing all the evidence that you could use into this presentation. But an LEQ is actually kind of short, so it's absolutely possible that you would use all of this evidence. You would really just use a fraction of it if you were actually writing an LEQ on this prompt. So here are my uh, parts of an LEQ. Here's my rubric. First, my thesis a historically defensible claim that responds to the prompt and establishes a line of reasoning. And remember, in an LEQ, that line of reasoning is going to consist of two points. Also, I get a point for my contextualization. I'm going to actually write, put that above my thesis and have my contextualization and my thesis together in the same paragraph. But a contextualization is a description of the broader historical context relative to my thesis. And keep in mind, we're only talking about three, maybe four things that just kind of gently lead you to your thesis statement. Also, my evidence, right? I've got two points of reasoning that I'm going to use. They're going to support my claim, and I'm going to give not only those two pieces of reasoning, but two concrete examples, one for each. My analysis and reasoning, that's a point. I'm going to use uh, a historical reasoning skill, whether it's comparison or causation or, or continuity and change over time, throughout the LEQ, and that's going to frame the LEQ and set the tone for the LEQ. Well, that's five points right there, but if I'm really going for the brass ring and I really want all six, I'm going to add my complex understanding. That's a demonstration of a complex understanding of this historical development using evidence to either co corroborate or qualify or modify my thesis. Some of my options for demonstrating, demonstrating a complex understanding are explaining both similarities and differences, or explaining both continuity and change, or explaining both causes and effects. So where are we talking about? We're talking about England, and we're talking about the Dutch Republic. And the time frame is from about 1600 to 1700. So let's say this was my thesis. Although there were several important effects of the Glorious Revolution, the causes were more significant. Now, I could turn that around, and I could make my thesis that the effects were more significant. But, but the point is to take a stand and then support it with evidence. So it doesn't really matter so much what your stand is. Some of these are 50-50, could go either way. So the historical reasoning skill being used here is causation, because my thesis is evaluating cause and effect. And here are my list of causes of the Glorious Revolution. Now remember, in my LEQ, I'm going to run really two causes, and I'm going to evaluate those. Um, three is really too many because you are on limited time and you don't need 
three to get all your points. But here are three. So I would I would discard the one that worked for me the least, right? But here are the the three that I've come up with as my causes for the glorious revolution. Number one, the divine right of kings doctrine versus parliament's belief in limits for monarchs. Number two, the need that England had for a monarchy, even if it's a limited one. And number three, the most significant cause of the glorious revolution was religious intolerance in England. Now you might be going at this point, I don't know anything about uh, really any of these. Well, the point of this, uh, this presentation is to go into all of that and explain this more fully. Here's my contextualization, and I'm going to use Grimes. So G for England. England was geographically close to Scotland and Ireland. That's going to be significant. R for religion. Lots of religion here. Puritan, Anglican, Church of England. Those representatives were highly influential in Parliament's House of Commons, and there was tremendous animosity between Puritans and Catholics. The Stuart King's own commitment to Protestantism seemed highly questionable to Puritans, even suspect. I for innovation, the Navigation Act, you can kind of think of those as an innovation. Another I for isms, Calvinism, Puritanism, Anglicanism, Catholicism. Another I for institutions, monarchy, parliament, the rump parliament, we're going to find out what that is. The new model army, the protectorate, we're going to find out about all of this. P for politics, Stuart King's, they believed in the divine right of kings. Famous theorists like Jean Baudin and Bishop Jacques Benigne Bossuet supported divine right of kings. But the English Parliament, they believe there should be limits to a monarch's power. E. Here's this navigation of acts again that comes up again. It's kind of there's a, a, very much an economic aspect of that. And social. How about Irish versus English? That's going to come up. What other context connects to my prompt. Let's start with divine right of king's doctrine, right? That's my first um, uh, supporting argument for my thesis, isn't it? Divine right of king's doctrine. Kings didn't come up with this idea by themselves. So who supported divine right of king's? We might bring up Jean Baudin. He had been a French law professor and political philosopher. He was a member of the Parlement that we talked about in, with France. He wrote a, against the background of the French Wars of Religion. And on a visit to England, he actually witnessed the 1581 brutal execution of English Catholic Jesuit priest Edmund Campion on the charge of conspiring with Rome to dethrone the Queen. But in reality, he was actually executed simply for opposing the Anglican Church. Jean Baudin was a secular theorist. He was a Catholic, but he was also highly critical of the of papal authority over state governments. He believed in a strong national government that was independent of church influence. And he opposed using government to enforce religion, especially as seeing Edmund Campion drawn and quartered, which was absolutely brutal and gruesome. As a French Catholic, Jean Baudin worked hard for religious tolerance. And he opposed wars against the Huguenots in France. He even tried to block royal taxation for the purposes of war against the Huguenots. And this actually got him in trouble with King Henry III of France. Baudin wrote the six books of the Republic in 1576. He was inspired to write it after seeing the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. And in this book, Baudin did a thorough examination of a wide range of political theories and past republics. And he even examined astrology and numerology. And Baudin rejected the idea of a mixed constitution. In other words, a constitution where you combine democracy over here and aristocracy over here and monarchy over here. He rejected resistance theory. Resistance theory is the idea that certain circumstances justified disobedience. He didn't believe in that. Well, the Six Books of the Republic was wildly popular, and it became a foundational treatise for politique theory. What were Baudin's views in the Six Books of the Republic? Well, Jean Baudin believed in a hereditary monarchy. 
He believed that the monarch's power should be sovereign. In other words, in other words, not subject to any other branch. However, the monarch's power can be somewhat limited, that's different, by the courts and by representative bodies such as a parliament or an estate's general or a congress. But most famously, Baudin argued that the monarch must be responsible only to God. That's a quotation. The monarch should have sole authority to make the laws. The monarch should admit should administer justice. The monarch should control the state's administrative system. The monarch should determine foreign policy. Let's also mention the hatred that Protestants, especially Puritans, had for Cat the Catholic Church and for Catholics. Let's explore real quick the mind of the Puritan regarding Catholics. And there's going to be a lot of prejudice here. Um, this is going to sound in many ways quite irrational and uh, fearful and hysterical. What might a Puritan have said to you if you asked a Puritan what he had against Catholics? Number one, Catholics want to take away your direct relationship with God. They want to replace it with empty rituals and sacraments. They want to put a cast of priestly gatekeepers between you and your God. Number two, Catholics want to take away the purity of your faith. They want to replace it with idolatry, worshiping saints and statues and relics. Number three, Catholics want to take away the simplicity of your worship. They want to replace it with ornate fixtures and gaudy, distracting decorations and priestly robes. And they want to tell you what hymns to sing and what prayers to pray. Number four, Catholics want to take away your Bible. They don't want you to read it for yourself. They want to tell you what they think it says. They want to control your understanding of God and of the Christian life and, and use that for their own purposes. Number five, Catholics want to take away your money. They want to give it to monasteries. They want to give it to bishoprics. They want to buy property with it and they want to send it to Rome. Catholics want to take away your country. They want to run your country's government. They want your king to work for them. King James I said it best himself, no bishops, no king. We're actually going to, to, going to explore that, that quote a little further in a later lesson. Sure, yeah, of course the bishops James I were referring to were Anglican bishops, but Anglican bishops and Catholic bishops are dangerously similar in almost every way. How much effort would it really take to make all those Anglican bishops Catholic? Catholics want England to be dominated by countries like France and Spain who have Catholic kings and Catholic populations. So what evidence can I use to support my causes and my thesis? Well, let's start with cause number one, the divine right of kings doctrine. James I, who ruled from 1603 to 1625, declared his divine right of kings explicitly to the House of Commons. And James I's son, Charles I, who reigned from 1625 to 1649, also followed this doctrine. Charles I refused to call Parliament at all from 1629 to 1640. Sounds a little bit like Louis XIV. And Charles I went around Parliament to levy taxes and raise armies. Divine right of kings caused multiple squabbles with Parliament over power. And these squabbles eventually led to the English Civil War from 1642 to 1649 and to the beheading of Charles I for treason. After the interregnum, a t period of time when England had no king because they had killed him, after the interregnum and the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, Charles II, who reigned from 1660 to 1685, also tried to go around Parliament. And in 1670, he arranged to have his cousin, absolute monarch, staunch Catholic Louis XIV, pay him a salary to supplement his income from Parliament. And in return for his salary... Charles II would favor Catholics in England and become Catholic himself. Charles II's brother, James II, who ruled from 1685 to 1688, repeatedly violated parliamentary law. 
The most important example was his regular violation of the Test Act of 1673, and we'll explain the Test Act in a minute. And Parliament finally invited James II's daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, to come to England from the Netherlands and replace him. So what evidence do we have to support our number two cause for the Glorious Revolution, which was that the English had a cultural need for monarchy? Well, at the end of the English Civil War, the, quote, rump parliament, and that was a, a, a remnant parliament, you might say, executed Charles I as a traitor and a heretic. And this was the first time that a king was ever executed in England, and it was a shocking and disturbing event for the English people. And in this context, the word rump actually means remnant because all the members who were not loyal to Cromwell had been forced out in 1649. We'll get into more of that later. Oliver Cromwell ruled England as a military dictator from 1648 to 1658. And he referred to England as, quote, the protectorate. He didn't want to be a king. He divided the country into military districts. He kept a standing army. And he had the army prepare a constitution for the country called the Instrument of Government in 1653. The Instrument of Government was never actually ratified. Cromwell also got into it with this rump parliament, just like the kings that he hated did. And in 1655, Cromwell dissolved the rump parliament himself, just like the hated kings of England had done, shouting, in the name of God, go. There's a picture of him doing it right there. Cromwell was a mercantilist. We've talked about mercantilism, just like absolute monarch King Louis XIV. Cromwell passed the First Navigation Act in 1651, requiring many English goods to be transported exclusively on English ships. No Dutch ships, no Spanish ships, no French ships, just English ones. And this resulted in a war, the First Anglo-Dutch War, with the Dutch Republic. Luckily for Cromwell, Cromwell won. Cromwell savagely reconquered Ireland, committing many anti-Catholic atrocities. Cromwell considered the Irish to be dangerous barbarians and heretics. Cromwell, a devout Puritan, was blatantly anti-Catholic. Between 200,000 and 600,000 Irish civilians died, and another 50,000 were deported as indentured laborers. The Protectorate, England, collapsed when Oliver Cromwell died in 1658. And the English rejected a continuation of military rule like he had installed. And they chose instead to return to civilian government. And the English restored the monarchy, bringing Charles II to the throne. And like I said, he ruled from 1660 to 1685. When the rule of Charles' brother James II, who ruled from 1685 to 1688, became unacceptable to Parliament, so blatantly Catholic, they replaced him with another monarch. And this replacement monarch was James II's own daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange. Both William and Mary were certifiably straight-up Protestant, which means they were acceptable. But the most important cause of the Glorious Revolution was our number three cause, religious intolerance on both sides. After all we've seen, I'm sure you could see that coming. Puritans in the House of Commons were very suspicious both of the Church of England and of the monarchs. They felt that the Church of England retained too many Catholic elements. And they felt that all the Stuart kings exhibited number one, Catholic connections, number two, Catholic sympathies, and number three, Catholic agendas. James I and divine right of kings. Let's go back to James I since we're exploring this third cause. Go back to him for a second. James I ruled Scotland for 20 years before becoming king of England in 1603. 
and by that time, James I had proven himself to be a popular and effective and capable monarch. And he knew for many years that he was the most likely successor to the childless Elizabeth I, and he believed that God had assigned him to unite Scotland and England under one crown. And he worked like crazy to ensure that his succession to the English throne would happen. During the Spanish Armada, he pledged his support to Elizabeth I, calling himself your natural son and compatriot of your country. And she already paid him a substantial annual pension just to keep him happy. And in her letters to him, Elizabeth I called him dearest brother and cousin. Never mind that she executed his mother. In 1598, James published The True Law of Free Monarchies. And in this book, he defended the divine right of kings. And he claimed that kings were a higher being than other men. And he argued that kings should be able to impose laws by royal prerogative. In other words, absolute power. And he argued that the only constraints on a monarch should be tradition and God. And then James became James I, King of England. And James I dismissed Parliament in 1610 and in 1614 over money and taxation issues. James I ruled without Parliament from 1614 to 1621. And to get revenue, he employed merchants who could raise money for him. And he sold noble titles, they were called baronazis, to get a lot of his income. See, these are things that we've seen before, haven't we? James I and his upbringing. As we know, James had a Catholic mother, Mary, Queen of Scots. And Mary had been at the center of violent conflict between Catholics and Protestants in both England and Scotland for many years. After almost 20 years of holding Mary in captivity, Elizabeth I reluctantly decided that she had no choice but to put Mary to death. James I was separated from her while he was still a baby, and he grew up not knowing her. And James was raised by regents, tutors, and keepers as a Protestant, and he was raised to believe that his mother was wicked. It's not known what his true feelings were about her. James I and the Church as soon as he became king of England, a group of English Puritans presented him with the millinery petition. And this millinery petition demanded that James get rid of all the things that Puritans found distastefully Catholic about the Protestant Church of England, the Anglican Church. And this notably included getting rid of the Church of England's bishops. They didn't like church hierarchy. They're Calvinists. They're Puritans. Of course, they're not going to like church hierarchy. Well, James I believed that supporting the authority of these Anglican bishops was essential to maintaining royal power. And his full response to their demands was this. If bishops were put out of power, I know what would become of my supremacy. No bishops, no king. When I mean to live under a presbytery, that's Calvinism, I will go to Scotland again. Now, of that entire quote, the only thing anybody ever remembers was no bishops, no king. But this kind of flushes that out a little bit, kind of to let you know what he really meant by that. In order to try to get some kind of reconciliation between the Church of England and the Puritans, James I called the Hampton Court Conference in 1604. And James I himself was well-versed in matters of theology, and he presided over the conference himself. And his position was that the monarch should continue to rule the Church of England through its bishops. Well, the Puritans hated everything about the Church of England that even hinted at Catholicism. And so the conference was not successful. But it did lead to the commissioning of the King James Bible which was completed in 1611. James I survived at least three Catholic plots to kill him. The most famous of these was the gunpowder plot, in which Guy Fawkes, he was not the leader of the plot, by the way, 
was discovered guarding 36 barrels of gunpowder, which was going to be used to blow up the House of Lords and King James with it on Parliament's opening day in November 1605. As a result, Parliament passed an Oath of Allegiance Act in 1606, in which every citizen had to deny that the Pope had any authority over the king. Not to deny Catholicism itself, just deny that the Pope had any authority over the king. James I viewed the oath as really more secular than religious. But many Catholic clergy and Jesuits left England rather than take this oath. And James I was lenient toward lay Catholics who took the oath. James I's son was Charles I, and Charles I inherited two attitudes from his father, James I. Number one, his absolute belief in the divine right of kings, and number two, his total disdain for Parliament. He married a French princess, the daughter of Henry IV, and of course, a Catholic, and he imposed the Anglican Common Book of Prayer on the Calvinist Scottish churches. Charles I's Archbishop of Canterbury, William Laud, imposed bishoprics on Calvinist Scotland, highly antithetical to the most basic of Calvinist beliefs. And he turned that phrase, no bishops, no king, into more bishops, more king. The Bishops' Wars, 1639 and 1640. Charles I attempted to impose his will on these Scottish Calvinists, also known as Presbyterians, by force. And he fought two small wars against the Scottish, which he lost. And so to get peace, Charles I had to agree to give the Scots everything they wanted and pay for their war costs. And he signed off on this at the Treaty of Ripon, in 1640. War with Parliament. Now he got himself into a corner, because in order to cover the costs of the bishops' wars and the costs specified in the treaty, Charles I had to call Parliament and ask them for the money. And Charles I had been running the country without them for 11 years. So first, Parliament was going to insist that Charles I not raise taxes, and not raise armies without their consent. And this dispute resulted in the English Civil War between the Parliamentarians, also known as the Roundheads, and the Royalists, also known as the Cavaliers, from 1642 to 1649. The New Model Army. This was the name of a parliamentary army which was formed to fight Charles I in 1645, with Oliver Cromwell as second in command. And this was a highly mobile, professional army. Cromwell recruited heavily from military veterans who had Puritan beliefs like his own and radical dissenting religious views. I mean, Cromwell's not just a, not just a Puritan, he's a radical Puritan. And he, with open hatred and disdain for anything Catholic, including Charles I's wife, who is a Catholic. Parliament had trouble raising enough money to pay the New Model Army. In 1648, the New Model Army defeated Charles I's royalist forces. Charles I himself was captured. The execution of Charles I. The radicals that Cromwell had recruited into the New Model Army, they wanted Charles I executed. Parliament refused. They voted 125 to 58 not to execute the king. So the radicals in the army that Cromwell had recruited purged Parliament of any of the king's friends, leaving only a rump or remnant Parliament. And this rump Parliament that had been purged of anybody that didn't want to execute the king, voted to execute Charles I with no problems. Oliver Cromwell reconquered Ireland in, from 1649 to 1653. 
He was still second in command of the New Model Army at the beginning of the campaign. And he massacred a Catholic garrison. He banned Catholicism in Ireland. He executed priests. He confiscated Catholic-held lands and gave them to common Protestant settlers. And in 1650, Cromwell was made commander of the New Model Army, and he continued to have it wage war in Ireland. Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. A couple of different attempts at a new parliament failed, and John Lambert wrote a new constitution, and he called his proposed constitution the Instrument of Government, 1653. And this document gave all Christians religious freedom in England, except the Catholics. And it named Oliver Cromwell as, quote, Lord Protector, unquote, for life. And England was now what was called a protectorate. Oliver Cromwell finally died in 1658. And Charles II was brought back in, brought in to be the king two years after Cromwell died. But soon, the monarchy and the parliament were at it again. And parliament passed the Test Act in 1673. And the Test Act said that no one outside the Church of England could hold office, teach, preach, attend the university, or hold meetings. But parliament was unable to actually enforce the Test Act. Uh, for example, William Penn was prosecuted for holding a Friends of Jesus, that's a Quaker meeting, the jury refused to even convict him. Charles II made a deal with his cousin, Louis XIV, in 1670, and in this deal, Charles II got a yearly salary from France, and in return for this salary, Charles II would relax anti-Catholic laws in England, and he would work to re-Catholicize England and he would become a Catholic himself. And this was a huge scandal when the public found out about this deal with France. James II. He became king in 1685, and he was openly pro-Catholic. James II completely ignored the Test Act of 1673. He appointed Catholics to the army, the university, to local government positions. He placed Catholic court judges who would not let defendants under the Test Act cases be convicted. He founded schools, and he declared religious freedom to all, including Catholics. Parliament and the Church of England offered the throne to James II's Protestant daughter, Mary, and her Dutch husband, William of Orange. And James II was forced to leave England with his family. And the crowning of William and Mary as king and queen, was known as the Glorious Revolution. William and Mary accepted Parliament's passing of the English Bill of Rights of 1689. And the English Bill of Rights said that Protestants could have arms, but Catholics could not. It said that dissenters, like, for example, uh, Calvinists and Quakers and Puritans, etc., they could all worship freely, but Catholics could not worship freely. And it said that no Catholic could ever be on the English throne. Now, let's say I wanted to present the effects of the Glorious Revolution. Now, why would I want to, re to present the effects of the Glorious Revolution in my LEQ if I'm arguing that the causes of the Glorious Revolution were more significant? Well, maybe I want to demonstrate my complex understanding of the topic by presenting the other side of my thesis, or maybe I find the effects to be more significant than the causes, and I want that to be my thesis instead. And here are my effects of the Glorious Revolution. Number one, the Glorious Revolution ended the doctrine of divine right of kings in, in England. England became a constitutional monarchy in which the monarch's power was limited by a constitution. The Glorious Revolution instituted the English Bill of Rights, which had a profound impact on the U.S. Constitution. So what evidence is there to support these effects? Well, number one, okay, so the Glorious Revolution ended the doctrine of divine right of kings in England. William and Mary 
they accepted the English Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights limited the monarch's power in five important ways. Number one, it gave Parliament the exclusive right to make all laws. Number two, it forbade the crown from suspending any laws. Number three, it said that Parliament must be called at least every three years. Number four, it provided for an independent judiciary. And number five, it forbade the keeping of a standing army in peacetime. However, the English Bill of Rights also contained important anti-Catholic elements. England became a constitutional monarchy, not a republic, and this constitution imposed limits upon the monarch's power, and the monarch was forbidden to be a Catholic. The English Bill of Rights, this document established England's constitutionalism. The English Bill of Rights influenced the American Revolution, it influenced the Declaration of Independence, it influenced the Constitution of the United States. It influenced constitutions around the world. Nevertheless, it was also blatantly anti-Catholic. Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679. Thomas Hobbes was one of the earliest Enlightenment philosophers, and we're going to get, it, going to, get to the Enlightenment soon. He was almost kind of a pre-Enlightenment guy. He straddled the fence between, you know, your Enlightenment era and your constitutionalism era. He excelled in numerous academic areas. He was a friend of Galileo. He was English, and he was a staunch supporter of the rights of the king, and this made him a royalist. And so, afraid for his life, he relocated to France in 1640 to watch the tragic events going on in England from France. And he moved back to England in 1650. Thomas Hobbes actually lived through the English Civil War, right, 1642-1649, observing from France. He lived through the regicide of Charles I the, the in 1649, observing that from France. And he lived through Cromwell's Puritan Protectorate from 1649 to 1658. And he spent most of that time in England. And Thomas Hobbes was one of the first of many Enlightenment thinkers to apply rational, scientific analysis to the study of society. He traveled to other countries several times to meet with scientists who studied government. And he became interested in why people let themselves be governed. And he began to seek the best form of government. And the result of all of this scientific analysis was his famous treatise, Leviathan in 1651. Leviathan was Thomas Hobbes' response to the English Civil War and the death of Charles I at the hands of the Puritans. 1651 was just two years after Charles I had been beheaded, and in his book Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes described human society as a dangerous and terrible monster. And this was because humans were inherently cruel, selfish, greedy, and hungry for power. People needed a strong, absolute monarch to protect them from themselves. And even if a monarch was bad, that was still better than the alternative, which was chaos, destruction, and death. Hobbes argued that of all the alternative forms of government, the only true and correct form of government was absolute monarchy. In an absolute monarchy, as we know, the king has the right to wield supreme and unchecked power over his subjects. And if people are placed in a, quote, state of nature, and we will explain this idea of a state of nature uh, more fully, especially with John Locke, then they will be in constant warfare with each other. The state of nature is the enlightenment term for a kind of primeval state in which man has no social, no legal, no political restrictions at all. It's kind of a, an abstract idea because it really doesn't exist anywhere in reality. So absolute monarchy is absolutely necessary to check this nature. In 1666, the parliament judged the book Leviathan to be atheistic. 
and Hobbes was not allowed to publish in England for some time. In Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes was one of the first of many Enlightenment philosophers to describe the idea of a social contract. A social contract is an existential agreement between a people and a ruler, as well as among the people themselves. It doesn't have to be written down anywhere. Maybe you can't see it, maybe you can't read it, maybe you can't touch it, but nevertheless, it's there and it's real. The social contract basically says this, we will submit to your rule as our monarch and in return, you will provide us with protection, security, stability, and order. Today, we might see absolute monarchy and the social contract as being in contradiction to each other. But Hobbes didn't. He did not see it that way. A social contract was more existential and less tangible than, say, a, a written constitution or a written bill of rights. John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau were two other famous Enlightenment thinkers who would expand on the idea of the social contract, especially Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote a book called, you guessed it, The Social Contract. Here's a quick review of Bishop Jacques Benigne Bossuet, whom we learned about really in Lesson 15-2. He was a French bishop. He was Louis XIV's court preacher. He was a brilliant speaker. He was an important courtier and politician. And he was a tutor to Louis XIV's oldest son. He was a relative latecomer to the whole divine right of kings debate. Jacques Benigne Bossuet saw government as inherently divine, of God and from God. And he argued this in his book, Politics Derived from the Very Words of Scripture, published in 1709, after he died. See, 1709, that is a latecomer to divine right of kings. Bossuet argued that the prince and the state were the same thing. Only public enemies saw a difference between the two. And he argued that God establishes kings as his ministers and reigns through them over the people. And so obedience to the ruler was a matter of religion and conscience. Jacques Benin Bossuet did not believe that the king was above the law. He believed that the kings must only use their power for public good. And he argued that if a king were to break the law, then he destroyed the law by his bad example. Comparing England's Glorious Revolution with the Dutch Republic. Now, why would I want to compare England's Glorious Revolution with the Dutch Republic in my LAQ? Well, keep in mind that comparison is another historical reasoning skill. And comparison is another way to demonstrate a complex understanding of the topic. The political success of the Dutch Republic was a result of the Netherlands' commercial prosperity. The Dutch took profits made from herring fishing and used them to develop a shipbuilding industry. And as a result of that, the Netherlands had the lowest shipping rates around. And the Dutch also had the largest merchant fleet in the world. The Dutch Republic had the highest standard of living in Europe. The highly Calvinistic Dutch Republic practiced thrift and frugality. And they also practiced a high degree of religious toleration. Jews enjoyed a particularly high level of acceptance in the Dutch Republic. Many Jews fled there from Spain and Portugal. Skilled Huguenots fled to the Dutch Republic and found work there after Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1689. And this religious freedom gave Jews and Huguenots the economic freedom to pursue successful economic enterprises, and this benefited the entire Dutch Republic economically.